Welcome to this special segment of The Black Moses, an interview featuring the late, great Dr. Miles Monroe. Thanks for tuning in. The Black Moses, the Elo Pinling story is a myriad of things in my mind. It's about the duality of Moses. It's about propaganda. It's about politics. It's about religion. It's about faith. And the black in the Black Moses does not just represent race, but it also represents noir, moral ambiguity, good versus evil. We travel from the Bahamas to three continents producing the film, Africa, North America, and Europe. And there were places and pockets on each continent where people didn't know who Sir Lyndon Pinling or Elo Pinling was. Some people didn't even know who, what, or where the Bahamas was but they all knew who Miles Monroe was. It became almost a cliche on the trip to ask, oh, well, you don't know who Pinling is or where the Bahamas is, but do you know who Miles Monroe is? And the answer 99.9% .9 of the time was yes, I know Dr. Miles Monroe. He is and was, without a doubt, our most famous Bahamian, an absolute rock star. Because of this offshore journey, I resolved that we weren't going to wrap production until we got Dr. Monroe in the film. And truth, that was purely a marketing decision. <laughs> we wanted to share the story of Sir Lyndon Pinling with the world. And who better to help us do that than the world's most famous Bahamian? So we chased Dr. Monroe down amidst his busy schedule. I prepared a few questions to ask him, not really sure what angle he was going to come from. Would it be religion? That was most likely. Would it be politics, political theology, perhaps? It was really neither. To my surprise, his approach was mythology. He approached Moses and the material much like I did in shadows and types and archetypes and prototypes, a shadow that's in light of a much greater reality. I had never read any of Dr. Monroe's books, to be honest. But on this matter, on the subject of Moses and Joshua, we were of one spirit and one mind. It was one of the most brilliant times I ever had. I remember telling my crew at the time that one day we'd publish the entire interview. Only I didn't know that it would be under these circumstances. The Black Moses is about 90 minutes in length. And while Dr. Miles Monroe appears in our film for about three minutes of screen time, his interview altogether was about 45 minutes. But perhaps he is still here. Because truth, his words now are much more powerful in death than they were in life. So here's our tribute to this most remarkable Bahamian. A man who's probably the greatest leader our nation has produced since Sir Lyndon Pinling. We hope you enjoy it as much as we did. And everyone begins in oppression. That's just the way it works out in history. And so the Church of Israel was a prototype. Egypt was a prototype. Moses is a prototype still. The, the great oppression, I would call in our time, was colonialism. And colonization was really the disintegration of the Roman Empire that became smaller kingdoms in Europe. Those kingdoms were built on defective philosophies of leadership, which was created by the Greeks. The Greeks indicated from their conviction that some men were born to be rulers, others were born to be ruled. Their belief system was that uh, some humans were born and chosen by the gods to be the elite, uh, while the masses of us were created by the gods just to be servants or slaves. Uh, that philosophy was a real philosophy for them, and the Romans adopted that and the Roman Empire uh, became Europe when it disintegrated. And the Europeans therefore inherited a philosophy which states that uh, uh, based on certain uh, birth traits, uh, physical characteristics, uh, for example, uh, the Greeks believed that if you were born with sharp nose, blue eyes, blonde hair, and fair skin, then you were designed by the gods to be the leaders. If you have dark skin, and broad nose, and uh, dark eyes, and thick lips, then you were destined by the gods to be a slave. 
So the issue was not whether you wanted to be a slave or not, or whether you wanted to be a ruler or not. It was a choice of the gods. That philosophy was inherited by the European uh, Roman Empire. And of course, when they obviously colonize the world, all those countries, for example, France, Britain, Portugal, Spain, and uh, you know the, the other nations that became great powerful kingdoms, uh, they had that philosophy. Of course, when they expanded their kingdoms and uh, they discovered new peoples in different areas, they observed the people. Uh, when they went to Africa to get slaves to work on their plantations, I mean, all of them did. That's why there are black people all over these kingdoms, whether it's Spanish or French or whatever. Uh, they obviously concluded that you were born to be slaves to work in our plantations, and you were born to uh, hew wood and serve us water and draw water from the well, and, and that's what you were born to do. In other words, it's not even a choice. Uh, this is why even today that still is still a reality, because if a, if a black man gets a Ph.D., uh, the concept that the oppressor has of him is that he's a smart slave. So it's not a matter that he's equal, he's just an intelligent slave. So, that slave. so that whole concept is still with us. And so we, we have this historical scenario where nations uh, oppressed certain groups of people, and most of them were the majority because the majority served the minority in all these contexts. You know, if you think about Egypt and uh, the turn of Israel, uh, you remember the words of Pharaoh. Pharaoh says, these people are multiplying too fast. And they will soon out outnumber us. In other words, the slaves eventually become more than the, than the master. And the same thing happened in all contexts. You know, if you study these, these islands in the, in, the, in, the, in the Caribbean, it ends up being more blacks or more Indians versus the European whites. So all, all oppressed people must have a, a Moses. Uh, Moses to me is not just a person, he's a symbol. Uh, and it's usually someone who history chooses. I prefer to use the word uh, divinity chooses. Uh, it's, it's very clear in the process of, of Israel that uh, the leader is usually a person who has a great passion for his own people. Uh, Moses are not just born. Moses always exists, but they're quiet. Uh, keep in mind, if you remember, that uh, Moses was educated in the palace of the oppressor. If you think about the Bahamas, Sir Lyndon went to, who was our Moses, I consider him to be our Moses, uh, he went to the palace of the oppressor also. He studied in Great Britain. Who do you think oppressed us? Great Britain. There were times in the Bahamas, and as a kid, I remember myself, I was at the tail end of oppression. You know, I, I lived through it just a little bit here. So I do have an appreciation for it. I lived at a time, I, I was born at a time when, uh, you know, there was no white people in our schools. Uh, we were not allowed to go in certain areas. The house I live in now was off limits to me to even go near it when I was a child. We couldn't drive out. I remember the fact that we could not go to a certain cinema. Uh, there's, you know, they had a black movie theater and a white movie theater. They had white restaurants and black restaurants right here in Nassau. So I experienced some of that. And it was just like Egypt. Uh, education was not for us. We were basically trained to be servants, not to be you know, of, the, of the intelligentsia. So uh, the experience of oppression is a reality uh, to me. And uh, sometimes I'm amazed that we don't talk about it more because if, if we don't remind the kids of history, uh, they'll destroy your future. And so oppression is where it all begins. And if you study Moses, Moses always had a question in his mind about who am I and am I a part of this palace life? You know, there's always that, that thing on the inside of a Moses, even though he's quiet, that's questioning his obligation to humanity. In other words, he, he refused to accept the system. And he lashed out against the system at the expense of being killed. 
and all Moseses do that. They, they come up, they come, they, they come a point in, in, in the life of a Moses where they, they make a decision to die. So therefore you can't kill them anymore. So all Moseses are dead before they start living because they, they, they internalize their death. They say, look, enough is enough. Uh, this may cost my life, but it's worth my life. I'm going to make an attempt to do something about this oppression. And this is why I always say dead men change the world. Because no one who is caught in that tide of history um, decides to live. They actually decide to die. And that's what makes them different. Uh, all humans want to live. But the ones that change the world are those who decide to die. You know, I've, I've had the privilege of, of being with Sir Lyndon personally in private environment, uh, talking about his life. And uh, those moments really changed my life because I heard the voice of a Moses. You know, he, he spoke in terms of, I really didn't want to do this, he says. You know, I, I, <laughs> I didn't look for this. This found me. And all true Moses are that way. They don't seek power. Power chooses them. Uh, life decides what they will become. Once they accept it, then they become a, 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 a child, a victim of destiny. And that's what happens to all Moses. If you ask them, uh, you know, did you know you were going to do this? They would say, no. <laughs> I have no idea this is going to happen to me. But there was a point where they had to accept it. And this is what Moseses do. They, they decide, I'd rather live with my people and suffer than to enjoy the pleasures of the palace of the oppressor. So Selinden Oscar Pinlin uh, emerged as, and I'm going to use this term intentionally, all Moseses are reluctant leaders. Uh, they never sought power. They have no desire to lead. Uh, they have no need to be in charge. So they are perfect for leadership because true leadership does not seek power. It seeks to empower people. And true leaders do not seek position. They seek to reposition people. And so this is why true leaders are reluctant leaders. And I, I had a pr I've met Sir Nelson Mandela. I had a chance to talk to him. I've met Sir Lyndon Pilling personally on many occasions. You know, uh, and these people have no desire for greatness. They just got caught up in a conviction that was so strong that they decided, I'm going to pay, pay the price to fulfill this conviction. And that's what creates a Moses. Uh, Moses wasn't alone, you know, there was a group. It's his sister, his brother, but he emerged as the one who will take the brunt of the, the, the attacks and, and also be the one who's willing to take the chance to die. And uh, Sir Lyndon Penling is the one who emerged in our context. Uh, I think also the reason why I think there's a, there's a divine involvement is because all true deliverers, and I use the word deliverers, Sir Lyndon Penling, like all Moses, they are deliverers. We confuse deliverers with freedom fighters. Uh, Sir Lyndon Penling was not chosen to, to set the Bahamas free. He was chosen to deliver the Bahamians the black Bahamians. Uh, Moses in Egypt did not set the people free. He was a deliverer of the people. And the deliverer simply means someone who takes them out of slavery and places them in the desert. Uh, he takes them from physical slavery. The mental slavery is the real issue. That's the tough part. That takes almost a generation to deal with, which I think we are pretty close to it now. I think people expected Moses to set them free. And the Bahamas uh, is not free. And we need to remember that. We are not free. We are delivered. You know, uh, the oppressor is still around, but he has no more physical control over us. But he still has a mental damage on us. We're still mentally damaged. And that's why deliverance is a very difficult period because uh, you are out of Egypt, but Egypt is not out of you. Uh, you are away from the wind of Egypt, but the scent of oppression is still in your nostrils. And so the, the, the deliverer will physically set you free. He takes the chains off, 
He opens the this prison doors. He tells you to go out. He even leads you out. But he can't take you in to freedom. Freedom is not a location, it's a mentality. So nothing is worse than taking a, a, a slave into freedom without freedom in his mind. Uh, there's a scripture I think that's very appropriate for our third world developing countries that I think is perfect description. It was written by Solomon. Solomon says, woe to the land when a slave becomes king. That word woe means the land is in trouble. The nation, in other words, when a slave become king means that even though you give the person power, they still think like a slave. And nothing is worse than a powerful slave because the mentality will destroy the people. And so wearing a crown doesn't change your mind. It exposes it. And this is why you need that period in deliverance to try and change the mentality of the, of the slave. Because if he, if he doesn't have a mental transformation, the slave will be no benefit to freedom. This is probably why when you read the, the, the story of Moses and the children of Israel, you'll discover that all of the people who came out of Egypt, all of them died in the desert. God didn't allow them to go in. Matter of fact, God told them, you will not enter the land. And he told them why. He said, because you have not changed your minds. So he kept them alive long enough to take what they were carrying out of them, which is the next generation. 40 years, it's a generation. So after 40 years, their children were born. These kids know nothing about Egypt. Then God buried all the parents. And Joshua, therefore, is always uh, a younger symbol. And uh, he, he has a glimpse of the future very clearly, but he also has an appreciation of the past. And there has to be a point in every national journey where the Moses must take the baton and give it to Joshua. This is where our countries have problems. Because Moses is the famous guy. Moses is the guy who is the guy who represents the symbol of power. Uh, he's the one everybody looks to for counsel. Everybody thinks that he has all the answers. So, so there's a temptation for the Moses to almost begin to believe his own fan mail. And he begins to also think of himself as more important than he really is. And that's dangerous. And this is why uh, when you study the story of Moses, God told Moses, uh, look, uh, uh, it's over. Now, Moses, keep in mind, is a symbol. Which means, and if you, if you read the transition between Moses and Joshua, they're actually two different books in the Bible. You know, the, the last book that Moses wrote is called Deuteronomy. The last chapter of it, it says, and Moses died. And the last few verses says, and Moses was dead. And Joshua, Moses laid hands on Joshua, presented him before the people. He went to the mountain, and then he never came back again. Matter of fact, the reason why God made sure that no one could find his grave is a very important thing because you, you can almost be so busy worshiping his history, you never make a future. So he doesn't want them to even know where the, the tomb is. You know, <laughs> No one knows where Moses was, was, was buried. So that's an important symbol. We should not worship Moses to the point where we can't create Joshua's. And so the last thing that is said about Moses is he died. When you turn the page, the next book is Joshua. But here's what amazes me. And in my book, I talk about this. The book of Deuteronomy ends where God says to the people, Moses is dead. When you turn the page, the first chapter of Joshua, which is the next generation, God repeats himself to Joshua, Moses is dead. I think the first one was saying a human died, a physical person died. But the next statement is the same statement, but it has a different meaning. It means an era is dead, a whole era, which means I don't want to talk about Moses anymore. Okay, uh, let's not depend on Moses to, to, to do what we need to do right now. Okay, let's appreciate him, respect his legacy, remember what he did, but let's move on now to our responsibility with Joshua. It is now your turn to take the people to the next phase, which is into freedom. Moses died on the wilderness side of the Jordan River. On the, on the next side is freedom. So Moses brought us over the Red Sea, which is deliverance. Joshua now has to take us over Jordan, which is freedom. Between 
The Red Sea and the Jordan River is the wilderness where we try to get mental transformation. Uh, if that can't happen, God creates a new generation and then he brings them over to freedom. So Joshua is an important person. Joshua is the one who brings the people into freedom. And this is where people begin to be free from the memory of history. Uh, they are free from the reproach of history. They begin to take on a sense of their own dignity, their value, their self-worth. They begin to feel that they have good self-esteem. They esteem themselves equal to anybody else. No one is better than them. Uh, they, they become mentally free to the point where they believe nothing is impossible. You know, though that's the group that Joshua takes over into the land. And uh, so that Joshua is the symbol of the, the next generation led by someone who believes that nothing is impossible. The next phase of national development has to be managed by the Joshuas. And I think the best years of the Bahamas is still ahead of us. So we, we never forget what Moseses have done. We never forget the price they paid. We should never neglect uh, to preserve their legacy. We must never stop uh, appreciating the price they paid. And, and because, you know, if you, if you don't appreciate your history, your future has no value. You know, the worth of something is determined by what you paid for it. So Joshua is a very important person. Joshua must make sure that, that his generation must not forget the price that Moses paid so that they could cherish the product that he bought with his life, which is the nation. Uh, if we do not tell the children of the next generation constantly the story of Moses, those children will have no appreciation for the value of the land that they have inherited. And they will deface it, they will destroy it, uh, they will treat it with no respect. And this is probably why social ills emerge from a country who forgets its history. Uh, one of the things I appreciate traveling to Israel every year is that every time I go to Israel every year for the last 35 years, uh, they always encourage you to go and visit a museum called Yad Vashem. Yad Vashem is a museum that recounts the history of Israel when six million Jews were killed in order to birth the new Israel today. And every time I go there, I see two things. Every time. There are buses lined up in front of that museum with little kids, four or five year old kids going through there. And it's a horrific museum. I mean, it shows you the graphic of the killing of millions of people, but they want the kids to see it. And then the second thing I see is buses laden with their soldiers. That's where they take their oath in the military regime. When they go through that, then they take the oath at the end of it, which means that they are reminded of the history of what they had to pay for that country. So that when those kids come out of that museum or those soldiers emerge from that museum, they have a re in their mind forever imprinted that this country was bought by blood and sweat and tears and people laid their lives down to give us what we have. We need that same spirit to be retained in the Bahamas and in the Caribbean countries. Otherwise, our children will not appreciate the value of our countries. And so they would, they would put graffiti everywhere. They'd throw bottles out of their windows. They'll, they'll kill their own brothers. Uh, they'll destroy and deface the country because they don't know the price was paid for this country. And this is why this documentary. It's so important to recount the life of Moses uh, and it sh the story should always be told. You know, uh, today, 4,000 years later or even more, uh, the Israelites still recount during a feast the freedom from Egypt. They call it the Passover feast and they, re they, they, they still recount the leaving of Egypt going into the desert by Moses. 4,000 years later, they still do it. As a matter of fact, the Feast of Passover and the Feast of Tents, today, you'll find that Jews in New York during that feast would leave their million dollar homes and live in a tent in the backyard for one day to remind themselves that their forefathers 
had to live in tents when they left slavery in the promised land. Maybe we need to do that. Maybe we need to have our children be reminded that we used to cook on three rocks under a tree. There was a time when we had no lights. So maybe, maybe we should spend a night every year with just candles so that the children will be reminded that we had to pay a price for electric lights and someone had to pay the price for us to have gas stoves. It's because if, if you forget or if you never remind them of what Moses did, we begin to think that uh, what we have just showed up and there's no value. Uh, all Moseses in history set people free, or, or deliver them rather, miraculously. All of them. Because there's divine intervention. In other words, what makes the Moses distinct from the other leaders is that they are caught up in an, in, in an act that only God can get credibility for, or credit for. And we call it a miracle. All of them have that experience. And, and so parting the Red Sea was the confirmation to the people that this man is the man that they should listen to and they should follow. That act, that miraculous act is important. Joshua had the same experience. All great leaders must experience an act that confirms them. Both of them were faced with water problems, <laughs> okay? But here's the point I want to make. The same God that was with Moses, he said he also was with Joshua. But he will never repeat the same miracles. And he will never do anything with Joshua the way he did it with Moses. It's different. So the methods will be completely different. But the objectives would be the same, freedom for the people. So Joshua had to face the water as well, Jordan River. Moses did his with a piece of wood, and it was a massive act, a miraculous act that confirmed him. Now Joshua meets two things, if you study the text carefully. Joshua meets a, a man dressed in a military suit. People don't understand that. When Joshua crossed the river, uh, the scripture says that uh, he, you know, and by the way, let me just say this too about Moses and Joshua. Moses had experience. Joshua had a vision. And sometimes experience can destroy vision, that young generation. But they want, the methods will be different. So Joshua did cross the water, but he, he walked in the water first. He got wet. And I think that there's some symbolic powers there. The next generation is not going to walk through on dry ground. They're going to have to get wet. They're going to feel some of the changes. Secondly, uh, they're going to have to do it as a corporate effort. Uh, the whole group went through the water and got wet, and the water went down as they walked. Uh, but here's what's important. As soon as they reached the other side, the first thing Joshua saw was not Jericho, which is a stronghold. He saw a man. And the scriptures say that this man was dressed in a military armor. If you, if you remember Moses, Moses, when they came out of Egypt, there was no military activity. It was all miraculous. Everything was given to them free by God. And all deliverance is that way. When the Bahamas were delivered by uh, Moses, we began to think everything was Bahamianization. We, we, we deserve this. We earn this. You know, we have a right to this. It's like, you know, hey, I'm supposed to have this. So, so we end up with this kind of spirit of, of everything is mine, you know, free, 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 free. Entitlement. The problem is with, 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 with Joshua is different. The soldier represents the idea that the next generation got to fight for everything that was promised to them. If they don't want to fight for it, they will lose it again. So the, the military symbol was communicating to Joshua, uh, Moses didn't have to fight, but you guys got to fight to take it now. So we, 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 we as the next generation of leaders in the Bahamas, post the Moses, we're going to have to be responsible for the future of the Bahamas. There won't be any more miracles. We're going to create our own miracles. That means we got to plant our own food and 
sew our own clothing. We got to build our own houses. We got to secure our own farms. We got to build our own boats. We got to take our own risks. And that's what I think we are uh, in danger of not doing, because we think that the miracles are still going to work. Let me, let, me, let me quote something in the story of Moses and Joshua that's very important. It says, the day that Joshua crossed the river, the manna stopped. Think about the implications. Manna represents free food, free covering, free nutrients, free supply, free, 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 social welfare. When they cross into freedom, God says, no more social welfare. You got to plant your own crops, grow your own food. You got to keep your own cattle. You got to secure your own fishing industry. In other words, if you don't work, you become a slave again. So my concern is, let me make the announcement again on this film. Moses is dead. Okay, get over it. Now, you're gonna have to pick it up from here as the next generation. And we gotta plan the future now. It ain't planned for us. We're gonna have to become the architects of the next Bahamas. And we're gonna have to work harder than Moses because there's no more freebies. There's nothing that will be handled. We ain't, we ain't entitled to nothing anymore. We either take it or somebody else comes in and take it. Either we control our country or we become a slave again to those who we allow to take it. So this is the generation of the Joshua's. And, and, and this, if there's one lesson we, we must learn from Sir Lyndon Oscar Pendleton, he finished his work. Now here's some, one, one thing about Moses' too. No, Moses is perfect. Moses had a problem, man. The guy had a short temper. <laughs> you know, he, he said some dumb things. As a matter of fact, he cursed the rock and the people. Okay, and that's why he didn't go in. So Moses has got frail, frailties. They, 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 got, they got clay feet, but they are still Moses. And we must respect them as Moses's. Martin Luther King Jr., people wrote books about his infidelity, all kinds, but he's still Moses. Nelson Mandela got divorced, didn't you know his wife, but he's still Moses. So don't get carried away about their human frailties. Their symbol in life is secure. They are Moses's. We must always respect the Moseses, defend them. We must preserve their legacy because they are the ones that keep the children anchored. These are the ones who you tell the stories about to your grandchildren. In the context of the United States, I believe that uh, from the perspective of the black people in America who were the oppressed slaves, uh, President Barack Obama is a symbol of the Joshua generation. Uh, he doesn't have really a memory of history because he was too young to experience the gravity of the oppression in America, but he, but he does have an awareness of the Moses. And so I, I see him as the Joshua of the black people. Uh, he inherited the legacy of uh, Moses, but now he's responsible for taking the people into the next phase, which is freedom. I think it's very important as I observe him that he not forget the Moses. I think that there is a caution I have in my own spirit that Barack Obama may have lost touch with Moses. If you lose touch with Moses, you forget about the value of what you have. And there's a temptation to get caught up in trying to please the oppressor more than to protect what the, the Moses paid for. So I think he may be a good lesson for all Joshua's to observe at this time. 